Welcome everybody to February and Blockhead meet Blockchain. Anybody remember Gumby's the Blockheads? <laughs> there we go, good. So a little bit of a warning. Basically, I was fairly lost when I started this talk. I had an idea. I thought I was going to do this in Perl. And the more I got into it, the more I realized if we would have talked about this maybe five years ago, there would have been a little bit more uh, availability of that. But uh, things are so kind of moving along. They're actually still kind of changing. Nothing's set in stone yet. But unfortunately, this is just going to be a talk. There's going to be very little bit, uh, actually no Perl code. But I'm hoping it'll still be entertaining. I do want this to be interactive. So if you have questions, please ask. This is a journey where, this is basically if we were hiking, I was going to say, I'm bushwhacking this trail. I don't know it yet. So um, I'm a little, I have a little bit more. I have an idea of a path. But if you have questions, please ask. If you have uh, experience, please share. This is where we're, we're all going to, you know, get a little bit more enriched. So the way that I started out or where this uh, talk came from was a simple a uh, question. What is a Bitcoin? Anybody? What's a Bitcoin? Can anybody tell me what is a Bitcoin? You give a value something that has <laughs> Okay, something that has no value, that has a great deal of value right now, yes? It's a bit. It's a Bitcoin is represented as a string. Yeah, it is a digital currency, sort of. But yeah, no, you're right. It is. Yes. Correct. It is not a fiat currency. I had to look that up. Fiat currency is a currency made by by fiat by someone saying it is a currency. The government, the dollar bill, that's a fiat currency. It has value because the government says it. Uh, Bitcoin has no value because of any one institution. So uh, this is the whole reason why I gave, I'm giving this talk, is what in the world is a Bitcoin? Because no one could tell me that. If you Googled what is a Bitcoin, the only thing you're going to come up with is blockchain, which it is a part of. So what is a Bitcoin? It's a unit that's gained by mining. And like someone said earlier, it is something that has no value that people think has a lot of value. Uh, the, genesis, the genesis block for Bitcoin, or the Bitcoin blockchain, was in January of 2009, and it contained 50 Bitcoins in it. And we'll get more into how it has, it has that in. The max Bitcoin that will ever be mined is 21 million, and uh, the last Bitcoin will be mined in 2408. The, and we'll, we'll get more into this. Basically, the the value or the number of Bitcoins that each block will receive, it has a half-life half of 21,000 blocks. A block is mined every 10 minutes. That's basically four years. So 2009, 2013, and so we are now in the third halving. So right now, anyone who mines a, a block, a blockchain, a Bitcoin blockchain, will get 12.5 Bitcoin, roughly. Gets a little bit more, but you know, anyway. So since it's going down half by half by half, basically 99% of all Bitcoins will be mined come by 2033, even though we're, we'll have another 100 years or so, or no, 300 years before we get every last, you know. Because of the half-life. Yes. In 2048, we will, uh, th and actually in June of 2048, we will reach 21 million Bitcoins created. So blockchain is really what we're interested in. The Bitcoin was the impetus for this talk, and it is part of why this actually has value and how this has gotten off the ground. So the blockchain white paper was published by Satoshi Nakamoto in October 08. Am I really mispronouncing that? No, no it's, just that, it's just that, he's, that, that maybe he's me. You know, who knows? Uh, exactly. <laughs> yes, that is true. We, we have no idea who Mr. Nakamoto is. It could be a single person, a group of people. Actually, the interesting thing is I would highly recommend reading the white paper. It's fairly simple. It's really straightforward, leaves lots of questions uh, to be answered. But it, I'm sorry? We found it. Oh, they did find him? Yeah, it was in the news. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't, I never knew if that was actually confirmed whether they actually found him or not, or whether that was an imposter. But basically, one person published a white paper. 
And in the white paper, it lays down some ground rules a tra uh, to transact directly with each other without the need for a trusted third party. Right now, if I want to give you money, I need a bank. Because otherwise, how would you know that the money is any good? We need fiat currency. The, the idea of the blockchain is that we can transfer something in between each other without needing the trust of that third party. The system, it's secured as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU than the, un, the dishonest nodes. And this is where we'll get, we won't really dive too deeply into that. This is the game theory of the blockchain. This is the idea that nodes that do the right thing will be rewarded. And a node that wants to do the bad thing, well, if it really wants to do it, it has to spend a lot of money. It's very disincentivized to do that. So there's a proof of work involves scanning the value of, hash, of hashes and that the hash begins with a number of zero. It's basically, this is part of, proof of work is expensive for a miner to do, but it's easy for everyone else to validate. It's basically, you create a hash out of some given values, which we'll dive into later, and then there is a, uh, a threshold, a level of difficulty, and the hash that you come up with needs to be less than that difficulty. Um, basically very expensive, very hard to figure out, but once you've figured out that hash, you can send it out to everyone and everyone can ha uh, create that hash themselves really fast and look at the difficulty and say, yes, this is lower than that, it has more zeros, like what he's saying here, and therefore it's good. The majority decision is represented by the longest chain with the greatest work of proof. So basically, if two miners emit a block at the same time, one of those will eventually become orphaned because only the one that will continue to be built upon, in other words, forming the longest chain, is the true chain. This is how you can get a decentralized group to agree on one thing. And we will get into that. And if, I'm, if I've missed some things, there's so much information to, uh, to cover here in so many different directions that if I'm missing something, please ask. So again, what is the blockchain? It's, it's basically this meeting of crypto cryptography, game theory, and of course, computer science. Cryptography is how we secure things. You know, we hash, we hash certain values to ensure that we accounted for everything. Uh, right now, they're using the SHA-256, which has a, a fairly good guarantee of no collisions, so that you know that if I give you this hash, that uniquely represents this one block. The game theory is actually where the Bitcoins come in. Right now, a miner wants to mine because they get Bitcoin out of it. And Bitcoin right now is going for three grand a pop. So there is a good incentive. And that's also where the di disincentive uh, comes from. A bad actor can spend a lot of time trying to uh, create a block that isn't correct to try to fool someone. But the problem is they've spent a lot of time getting this block out into the ecosystem only to get rejected. And once it's rejected, you know, th that's, that's time that they don't get back. So blockchain, really all it is is a shared ledger. It is records of transactions. They are the records of the individual transactions and I love this word, clubbed transactions. Club transactions or when you put them all together, you club them, although it really sounds like you're clubbing baby seals is becomes one block and that information is then used to to figure out the it to be, do the proof of work on that block and then transmit it to the rest of the uh rest of the the system and that's our distributed database the reason for you know distributed every node has a copy of everything that's not totally true because there are different types of node but we'll get into that later but in this distributed database, each block links to the previous block, therefore becomes immutable. One of the, one of the things I couldn't find, again, again, reading a lot on this, is that one of the key components of the hashing algorithm used is that if you make a small change, if you make any change to an already created block, even a tiny change, you take it from capital letter to a small letter, just one letter, not the whole thing, it drastically changes the hash value. In doing so, you then have to, since each block links to the previous block, if you want to change anything but the first block, you have to change every block above it. And we'll get into, 
you know, how, why this takes so much time. So a distributed network. As I said, every node has a full copy of the ledger. Again, not fully true. You can have just your wallet, which just knows about your transactions, and enough about the transactions around it to be able to verify that. You have partial nodes, which all they have are the headers of a block, and therefore they can, they can uh, speak to the validity of the chain itself, but they don't know what's in it. Then you have full nodes. Those are the mining nodes. They have everything. They have the header, and they have the transactions within it. In this distributed system, there is no single point of failure, sort of. We'll get into exceptions later. Uh, but, I mean, seriously, as long as you don't have 50% of bad actors or more than 50%, you can lose as many nodes as possible. In fact, you could lose the whole network. If you have the full node yourself, you still know the state, sort of. Of Yeah, well, th th there is. Uh, again, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get into the, the The point comes to this 51%. And it can also be done when the community comes together and says, we have a problem, we need to rectify it, we've made a decision, and the entire community works as one. And again, since everything is immutable, you know, you have faith in it. My copy has to be the same as your copy. If you have a bad copy, then you will not be able to play with the other nodes. Because if, you, if uh, a node uh, tries to publish a new... Uh, block, it will not work with your node, uh, with your corrupted copy. Or if you're trying to get ahead of everyone else by publishing, by let's say altering the current top block and using that to create your new, f new fake block, you're going to then distribute it and find out that no one else can solve your problem because they're going off a completely different hash. So that, that gets us to the idea of consensus. And I already kind of touched on this. And rather than trying to write anything, I just, I, I just decided to go to Wikipedia. This is basically the idea of proof of work. We have a string, hello world, and we need to uh, solve it for a proof of work. And I forgot, where does it show me that the proof of work? Somewhere it gives me the answer of what the target is. Oh, okay, the target is hashes to be a value smaller than two, the two, two to the 240th power. So as you notice, so basically this is what happens. The miner, the very simple version, takes the string and adds a nonce to it. A nonce is a single use value. This is the variable. This is what the miners are trying to find. They're trying to find the right value. Well, when you hash that, you get this. Well, that's definitely much bigger than 2 to the 240th. And you start incrementing, and you keep going. This one, it took it until 4,250 to get this hash, which was just below than 2 to the 240th. So, obviously, very simple example, but the thing is it took it 4,250 tries to get this. Now it can send this out to everybody in the network, and they just basically do this SHA, and they say, oh yeah, it works. This is a valid block now. Obviously, it's much more complicated in real world, but it's the way to, to demonstrate this. This is the proof of work. This is what takes so long. So, Oh, that comes uh, later. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, Bitcoin, first decentralized digital currency. It's, um, Bitcoin is not the blockchain. Block, I found this again somewhere, and I don't know where, so I can't attribute it to the rightful author, but it's blockchain is to Bitcoin as the internet is to email. Bitcoin is a part of a blockchain. It's an idea of it, but the, the, the core fundamentals of a blockchain uh, can be more or less, or you can do it yourself. You can... You can start up your own thing and call it, oh, I don't have a good name for it, but you know, call it whatever you wish. Tank chain. tank chain. We'll call it tank chain. There we go. <laughs> Basically, it is an open ledger for every transaction. Every block is shared with everyone. Everyone sees it. Um, oh, and just for fun, uh, you, can, you can sell up to 1-800, whatever that is, 1 times 10 to the 8th. It's called a Satoshi for the creator. And it's been mined from 2009, and we'll end mining in 2048, a maximum of 21 million. And we'll get to the blockchain explorer in just a second, because I wanted to talk about its limitations. The Bitcoin, this is the Bitcoin blockchain. It's not blockchain limitations. Bitcoin blockchain limitations is it can only be used for peer-to-peer -peer UTXOs. UTXOs are un... 
I have it written down? Unspent transactions output. Unspent transaction outputs. This basically means that Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't have a state. It doesn't know how much money you have. It only knows that if I want to send you a Bitcoin, I need to have an unspent transaction output of greater than one. And I will split that into one for you, so much, and then a second one, which comes back to me. Let's say I, ha I have 1.5 Bitcoin. I want to send you, Steve, a Bitcoin. So I take the UTXO, I split it into two. One is for one to your wallet, which you've given me the public address to. The other one comes back to my wallet. Now, of course, the miner needs some, some you know, skin in the game, so there is also a transaction fee. Initially, the transaction fee was voluntary. You could do transactions for zero money, and then it would be up to, be up to you to see if a you know, Bitcoin miner ever picked it up. Or, but now, lately, they have become mandatory. It, it, uh, and we'll see those in a little bit. Wow. So uh, the other limitation is that says POW. No, proof of work. I don't know why that's happening, sorry. Proof of work is expensive. Uh, an article in uh, blockgeeks.com uh, called Bitcoin's Energy Consumption. In June 2015, it found that a Bitcoin transaction required the same amount of energy to power 1.57 American households for a day. And these aren't average households. They're 2,700 square foot households, which that is a gigantic thing. So again, this is the incentive. This is the, um, the gaming theory. It behooves everyone to play nicely because if you're not playing nicely, you're wasting just a lot of power. Uh, it's vulnerable to external 51% attacks. So basically, if someone has the power, uh, has more power than 50% of the network, they can dictate the block because they can calculate blocks faster. That means they can shove them down your throat and say, no, this is right, even though they might be doing wrong. It also behooves it if the community comes together and say, we have a problem, we need to fix this. Everyone can implement the problem, uh, the fix, and thus correct, course correct. Oh, it's not searchable, really. Unless, if you don't have, a trans if you don't have the hash, you can't find it, unless you want to tra uh, traverse the entire blockchain. But again, the only thing you're going to find is the hashes. So if you don't know the hash, you got nothing. And uh, if, you've lost your pub if you've lost the hit hash, that means you've probably also lost the private key, and that's the one that can actually unlock your money. Hence, where you hear a lot about people who have Bitcoin, they got it really early, they lost their wallet, they can't open their wallet, so there's, I don't even know how much Bitcoin, I didn't think to look, that is out there that isn't being used. Oh, and also, right now, 91% of all Bitcoins have been already mined. So from now until 2408, is 9% of Bitcoins left. Thanks to having. <coughs> no. Oh, no chargebacks. Once, uh, once you've given the Bitcoin and it's been proven into the chain, you cannot get it back. If someone ripped you off, I'm sorry, you've lost that money. It is now in their hands. There's nothing you can do unless you know the person and can prove it was them and they're in your jurisdiction and the police know what in the world you're talking about. You're just kind of screwed. <coughs> so really quick. Okay, I'm going to just... Let me end this and try to start over again. See if okay, good. So this is kind of, this is the structure of of a blockchain. So we have the Genesis block. It is unique because it doesn't come from anything, but it creates it creates the the beginning. So basically, this is what gets hashed. You have the pointer to the previous block, which is its hash. It's 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 hash of its entire payload. Then you have a Merkle root, which basically that's just a fancy way of saying you have this many transactions in it, you hash it together in a specific manner, and that proves that all these transactions inside your, uh, inside your payload are valid. Um, I'm going to leave that, again, if you're interested in that, uh, look at Merkle root, and uh, there, I, I do have a good article for that later on. But that's how transactions can be validated before they really get into a block. Then it has a timestamp and then the nonce. This is the thing that they're trying to guess. For a blockchain, we, we saw the example of Hello World. For the blockchain, it is a hashing of the previous hash, the timestamp, the Merkle root, the nonce, the level of difficulty, all that together. And it, 
it ha that hash needs to be less than the level of difficulty hash. And I lost a slide somewhere, so I'll, I guess I'll cover it here. So, I mean, basically, you're, you're, you're incrementing this by one every time. I'm sure that there are better strategies, but since a hash is not a linear thing or a progressive thing, just because you're jumping from a nonce of 1 to 100, and uh, let's say that the answer is at 102, doesn't mean that you can see that you're 100 closer to it, because, it, you know, the, 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 the nonce that solved it could be 3, but there is no correlation. So that becomes really expensive. It's a big calculation, and every time it basically takes 10 minutes to solve a uh, a Bitcoin or to prove a Bitcoin block. Why 10 minutes? It's because of the level of difficulty that gets put into this. Again, right now the level of difficulty has somewhere in it starts with about 13 zeros. Every 2,000 or so transactions, the level of difficulty is examined. How long did it take to do the last 2,000 some odd blocks? Did it take an average of 10 minutes? If it took more, they lower the, uh, they make the level of difficulty easier, oh, which means they would raise it. There we go. And if, uh, let's say, if it's an average of eight minutes for every block, they will make the level of difficulty harder. The idea is that every 2,000 blocks, it reevaluates the level of difficulty, trying to aim in at 10, min uh, 10 minutes for every block. And then that's where you get the four year, and that's where you get 2408. Yeah. So um, let's just uh, take a look at what blocks look like. So this is uh, blockexplorer.com. Um, oh, there we go. So now uh, it should be refreshing, but I've had this open for a while. Yeah, two hours ago. Let's go a little. There we go. So one minute ago, this block was uh, proposed. 11 minutes ago before that. Sometimes you have these really quick blocks. I don't know if that just means that, I'm assuming that's two blocks that were proposed at the same time and one of those may fall off. I haven't figured that part out yet. But basically here we can go inside the block. Here we can see the number of trans, uh, transactions in this block. So there are 29, 16 transactions. Um, the block reward is 12.5 Bitcoins. The timestamp, the Merkle root, so this is the hashing of all of the transactions. That's the nonce. So basically, either they have a good uh, algorithm or they had to run the same thing one million, 3.6 billion times to figure that out. Should have taken them around 10, 10 minutes. Um, and here you can see, this is, see, no inputs. These are the newly generated coins. This is 12.59, so that's basically the 12... 12.5 plus all the fees that this guy is getting from all the transactions. So, let's, so, uh, so every block basically has a bunch of transactions in it and one Coinbase transaction. The coin, uh, would of course, only until 2048, at which point in time the, uh, the miners will only be able to get the, uh, the, fi uh, the finance charges, or the fees, I should say. So here's a great example. This person... C8B3, uh, needed to pay um, two people all of their Bitcoins, I would assume. Or this may be a different, uh, w they may have a, s a different wallet. But they used three UTXOs that equaled up to, I can't do math. Um, but basically, they pay 0.9 to this wallet and the rest went to this wallet. Minus, of course, their fee. So 2.68. So it's $3,000 per Bitcoin, so that person spent seven, eight dollars to run these two transactions. But this is basically how it works. It's not, I have, I have a wallet with 10, 10 Bitcoins in it. I have four unspent transactions, and I'm gonna turn them into two. Or I have one, and I'll turn them, oh, here we go. I have one of, of 18, oh, and here we go. And I'm paying off th three people, as you notice, that is his, his or her wallet. So paid off 0.01 there, 0.02 there, 4.2 whatever there, a fee of 0 0.001, about three bucks, and the rest goes back into their wallet. So that, that's it. That's, that's how the blockchain works, and that's how, what Bitcoin is. The Bitcoin is the incentive. The fact that it's worth 3,000 bucks, that, you know, your guess is as good as mine. And the, you know, 3,000 bucks per share? Per Bitcoin, per, Bitcoin. per single Bitcoin. And you can transfer up to 
10 to the minus 8 of a Bitcoin or one s uh, Shatosi. Sh no, I get that. Yes, that definitely been a bit, uh, roller coaster. The high was what, twenty thousand? Yeah, and then it pulled up like what, three. Yeah, so now it's three. Yeah. So, you know, and it's that's you know what. I'm not here to advocate for what, whether it's a good investment or not. I'm just here to try to describe to you what the Bitcoin is, how you get it, and what's involved with learning it. So this is kind of this is this is the blockchain. This is kind of what they call blockchain 1.0. Ethereum is basically blockchain 2.0. It came out from a Vatilic Buterin. When I'm going through this with my head, I usually can pronounce the names. So uh, by Vatilic, he uh, proposed this white paper, which I didn't find until last night, so I have not actually read it. It's a little bit longer than the uh, Bitcoin uh, white paper, but it is, uh, again, freely available. Uh, basically, it launched on July 30th, of 2015 with 72 million ETHs available. Uh, basically, the thing that uh, Ethereum has given us is power, and so it's no longer just a transactional-based thing by uh, introducing what's called a Turing-complete language. Uh, never heard of that before. Turing-complete simply means that it's a language that will allow you to build a Turing-like machine. Whether or not it passes the Turing test, that's your problem, but you could. Uh, it does that through the EVM, which is the Ethereum virtual machine, and the DAO, which is the uh, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which what in the hell is it? Uh, what is that? So basically, this is what we think of organizations. You know, it's just a top-down structure. Everyone, you know, talks to the people above them, and everyone follows the... Uh, follows the command from up above. Decentralized means just this. It's just, it's a machine consensus, which blockchain can give us, uh, around like token governance of uh, basically rule set and smart contracts. So basically it is the language, it is the machine that runs Ethereum and allows the execution of these smart contracts and Ethereum smart contracts. There it is again, that's weird. So, uh, you know, this is where I talked about the consensus problem. I'll have another example later. People, when you talk to them, they're always talking about Bitcoin is the future. Bitcoin is solid. Bitcoin is amazing. Well, you know, one year after uh, Ethereum went out, the DAO, the, the base language, had a bit of a bug that allowed 50 million ETHs to be removed. So the community came together and basically says, okay, we're going to do a hard fork. The ETCs are the original ones, they will reflect the theft. ETH, which is what everybody uses, we will remove the theft. It never happened. So if enough people want to change the rules, they can. So, you know, something to worry about. And I apologize, I do not know what's going on there. So again, Ethereum, more information. ETH is 10 to the 18th way. I don't forgot where they got away from, but so 10 to the 18th, you can, you can spend much more granularly. And this comes important, uh, you'll see in a second, mining rewards you with three ETH. So every block that you form, that you prove, you get three. There's no half-lifing it, it isn't capped. Although there is a proposal that will drop it down to two. And uh, this is the fun part. It does use uh, currently proof of work, but it does get created every 12 to 15 seconds. A lot faster than um, uh, Bitcoin's 10 minutes. But they are moving to something called a proof of stake, which I don't fully understand yet, but basically says that instead of uh, a miner being randomly selected, the, the miner that has the biggest stake in the block will be selected through some type of an algorithm. Um, again, at 12 to 15 seconds, if someone has, I have this huge transaction, I really need to get in there, somehow they get to go first and you have to wait 12 seconds for yours to get in there, that's really not that big of a deal. But again, th this move has not happened yet, but it will. And it will it'll change the calculations and things moving forward. Also, Ethereum has two types of account. It has external, externally owned accounts, that would be for people like you and I, humans, and then contract accounts. These act just like regular accounts, except for they have a defined code. <coughs> Excuse me, a defined code. They only execute in very specific manners. And they, um, they can be triggered from external owned accounts or from other contracts as well. 
And uh, you can look at um, the Ethereum scan. And actually, we'll just go there right now. I am skipping one important part, but this is just interesting to kind of look at. So again, kind of like Bitcoin scan, but uh, here, here are the blocks. This is the last one, you know, 24 seconds ago. Um, 114 transactions in it. There we go. So again, we can see a timestamp, uh, 114 transactions with 26 contracts. The, ha the hash, this is the previous block. Um, who mined it, the difficulty number. So then, you know, you could then compare, you know, run the, ca uh, run the formula and compare their hash versus the difficulty. Um, and then we should be able to see... I in the... Nope. Here we go. So here, this is a straight transaction. It's from this uh, wallet to this wallet. So you can see this, these, this indicates it's a contract. So let's take a look at this contract. I'm still trying to figure out how you can see what the code is. So public information? Yes, the contracts are, everything is public. There is no hidden or secret sauce here. If you need to, if you are, if you want to do a blockchain and it needs permissioning or it needs to be a little bit more private, you need to write your own thing. Ethereum, the Ethereum blockchain, is open to everyone. Everyone has a copy for this. I, somehow you should be able to see what exactly this function is. I haven't deciphered that yet. But basically, when this, when this uh, contract uh, goes, it, reading this, it just basically transfers from the owner's account uh, this much value to that. So it's, it's just a simple transfer. It, it would be just as, uh, as easy to do a regular transfer. But because it's an, uh, uh, a contract, it means that something triggered it. And the triggering, it can be really anything. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a second. So the, the important part, and I will give you a link on how to write contracts, because that is a whole setup. And actually, there's some really, this is basically where the idea of writing anything in Pro went out the window, because um, there are languages already written for those contracts. There are test environments. There are test blockchains where you can get test Ethereum to and, and play around with everything. So at, at that point in time, it just kind of looked at, well, this is just going to be a talk, and you'll have to listen to me babble. So um, have gas, we'll calculate. Very important in Ethereum, very important to understand the gas. The gas is an execution fee. It is, uh, it's, it's for either a regular co uh, contract, or for a contract, or just even a regular transaction. It basically limits execution length. This means that you can't write something poorly and then lock up a miner because whatever you're executing takes forever, or even worse, gets locked into an infinite loop. So th that, that becomes really important. You carefully need to consider the gas that you're going to give your contract. Basically, how to calculate it is the transaction fee, which is an Ethereum, is the gas used by the gas price, which is also an Ethereum. So the question then becomes, why not just make it a, a simple Ethereum? I want to spend this much Ethereum on it. And it kind of comes back to this is their, t their way of trying to control fees against a potential explosion in the price of Ethereum itself. Let's say you want this transaction to really go through. You're willing to spend a whole Ethereum on it because you got one from your last mining operation. But all of a sudden, Ethereum explodes to you know $10,000 for one. Now you're paying $10,000 for that one transaction. This is their way of basically controlling for that. And the way that it's done is gas used is basically the work done. So for making one hash, it costs you 30 gas, 30 units of work. Um, and every transaction, you specify the gas price. So that becomes a real, can become a real problem. If you go too low, Let's say uh, all you need to do is hash it for once, uh, but you give it a gas price that only gives you 29 gas units. It'll never get done. The, the miner will run until you run out of money, and it'll say, well, that is a rejected transaction. Your transaction will fall away with no gas, and guess what? The money that you spent uh, in gas gets given to the miner because the miner did the work. You just did a poor job of figuring out how much to pay for that work. You go too high, you may run out of gas.
Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Yeah. If you go too high, you may run out of Ethereum. It, it's basically if you only have so much in your wallet, but you say, oh, I'm willing to spend five for it, and something happens where all of a sudden it does take you know, way longer than you expected, or you're using bad code, then it says, okay, that'll be 10 Ethereum, and you have nine in your, ba you know, in your bank account, and then that's it. So there are tools out there that help you calculate what you're trying to do. It is something you do need to pay, uh, pay attention to. It's, it's gas times the price, price of that gas. How much are you willing to pay to get it in there? If you guess wrong, it costs you a lot. The first Stack Overflow I ran into, it cost the guy $116 because he did not understand it and his gas was gone. And yeah, and basically the, the, the worst problem is the transaction is invalid because there is no gas price there. You need to, if you still need it to happen, you need to start all over again. And hopefully if it is a contract, you'll fix whatever broke in it. I, I wonder if it's the dongle. So basically, the contracts. This is, um, this is all I'm going to say about it, so enjoy. Um, there are many different uh, computer, uh, there are programming languages already designed for it. The most, uh, the most popular one that I've run into is called Solidity. And if you Google for that, you'll find it. Um, it's basically, it's like any other programming language. It gets executed on the EVM, EVM yep, and it does what needs to be done. The, uh, it basically... It's kind of like the Docker way of a, co a contract. In Docker, in the Docker file, you specify exactly how you built your server, so you never have to wonder it again. With the, with the contracts that Ethereum provides, now you never have to wonder, what is the penalty for this again? Or what did I say about this? Because the contract is there. Now, just because you've written the contract doesn't necessarily mean that it gets injected immediately. So like uh, Gnosis, it's a prediction marketplace platform. You create contracts of the Patriots are going to win the Super Bowl. Yay. Um, and so you create that contract. You re as, uh, as far as I understand it, you registered with them. They then wait to see for the Super Bowl to end. And once the Super Bowl is ended, they inject your contract. And then the contract will resolve itself. And you don't have to say, well, was there a point spread? How much money do I owe you? Oh, I totally forgot about it. And you have to remind me. Yeah. Um, this is a fantastic starter on writing Ethereum smart contracts with so, uh, Solidity. It goes through setting up a test wallet with the test uh, chain. I, there's no way that I could think of anyone to see that, so this is the shortened uh, version of it. Um, you can spend, we could spend like hours just in that tutorial. So, <sighs> There we go. Uh, so that's where you would learn about the contracts. So anyway, the contracts from Ethereum gets us to this thing called dApps, and that's the new hot thing. Distributed application development. And basically, the best way to describe this is traditionally we have a front end, we have a middleware, an API, REST call, you name it, we all have it, and then we have a database. With dApps, we have the same thing. We have a front end, we have a smart contract, and then we have a blockchain. That's the whole different way. And this is... This is the idea of, of basically uh, the next slide of, is basically, oh, and we'll get to this uh, site in a second. So basically, why are you considering a blockchain? Why do you want to do a blockchain? You know, we have our pointy hair boss. He wants the mauve one, when we really know the blue one has the most RAM. Um, so in considering, you have to ask yourself, do I need a shared database? If the answer is no, then you have no use for a blockchain, because it is a shared database. Um, do you, are you going to have multiple writers? You know, do you need multiple people to contribute to it? Do you have trust issues among those writers? In other words, is th if you have one centralized authority that, someone, uh, that everyone looks at, then you don't need a blockchain because then you really you don't need a shared database anymore. You just have multiple users to one database that one person runs. But if you have all of these, you need to basically instill trust in a network of people where there is no centralized unit of trust, then it's time to go for a blockchain. But as you'll notice with the previous thing, with the dApps, uh, basically saying dApps are now front-end smart contract blo blockchain, there's not a lot of code here. The blockchain code is very simple. I mean, it can become really complex, but 
the thing is, it's a, they're simple languages. It's, it's, I'm not trying to call Java simple, but basically it's like writing Java. It's like writing anything else. This basically says that to use blockchain, it is a business decision. You have to think differently to use blockchain. It's not a, oh, blockchain is cool. Let's do exactly the same thing using blockchain. That is the wrong way of going about it. It's, we have this great idea. We don't want to trust any single person. We think it's great that everybody can see what's going on. Now we can use a blockchain. The, the code's going to be simple. Well, okay, relatively simple. Because the heavy lifting, the network discovery, the network, uh, the talking, the mining, all of that exists in the Ethereum chain and in the, uh, in the Bitcoin chain. You just need to build your application on top of it. So then the only question is, do you use Bitcoin or do you use Ethereum? So then that kind of comes down to this, is do you need a Turing complete contract? Believe it or not, Bitcoin does have a contract. It's just set in stone. It basically says money in, money out. A little bit more complicated than that. It does some crypto uh, cryptography. Ethereum, it does have flexible contracts. Let's call them that way. You need something that's decentralized. Of course, they both have. Blockchain creation, how important is speed to you? Ethereum is really quick. Bitcoin is slower. Also, the purpose. If you're just doing payment transactions, you may not need the, the heft of Ethereum. I now know where that slide went. Sorry. Um, Ethereum you'd use if you're going to just basically have a peer-to-peer -peer network of contracts that are basically governed by the community. Um, again, I'm going to go back to this. When you talk to people who are mining Bitcoin, they're going to talk about the beautiful wonderful Bitcoin, how bulletproof it is, how awesome it is, how it can do no wrong. This is from September of last year. Um, a bug was identified by Omni, and basically most catastrophic bug in recent years, it's certainly of the most catastrophic bugs in Bitcoin ever. This was last September. And Omni publicly expressed his feed, uh, feedback without hesitating to call Bitcoin's core most prominent developer arrogant. Again, know your technology. The, uh, the blockchain is a great technology. It's a great way forward. You can write it yourself if you need a little bit more control. But if you play out in the wild, realize that you are still at the whims of the majority, even if they think that they're doing good. So uh, these are the resources for today's talk. Most of what I learned came out of this beginning blockchain, a beginner's guide to building blockchain solutions. This is not a dummies or idiots guide. This thing goes deep in every direction. In fact, if, there was, if there's like a section that you guys want to dig into for next time around, I'm happy to do that. There is just, I mean, the, I mean I'm at uh, uh, 45 minutes right now and I feel like I've skimmed over so much. I hope I didn't go too fast to stop anyone from asking questions. But uh, fantastic book, highly recommend it. Um, this thing guide to what is crypto econo uh, economics. It basically covers everything that's in this book in a much more shallow way. Um, so if you want a deeper dive into what I've been talking about, that's a great medium point if you don't want to go as far as this thing. Because this has an entire chapter on asymmetric versus symmetric encryption. It's really kind of cool. Of course, the two white papers. And um, if you are interested, someone did write of, uh, a Bitcoin blockchain implementation, uh, the author makes it very clear that this is just a proof of concept. He was just following someone's tutorial to see if he could do it. It's pretty raw, but it is there. Um, so are there any other questions before I conclude? Yes. So, um, at this time, it makes zero <coughs> sense to spend a lot of money on buying a mining rig for Bitcoin, even if I used eight six. There are a lot of people, the uh, question is, at this time, it uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to buy uh, a, a Bitcoin rig. Um, honestly, I, I, I can't speak to that. Obviously, the, uh, the, Bitcoin, um, the Bitcoin evangelists, they would say, of course it is. It's going to make you money hand over fist. Um, pardon my recipes. But how do you react with the power? Yeah. Well, that, the the well, that too. Um, oh, there's a K in there. So, I mean, it really depends on what you feel that the, uh, the cost of, um, the cost of Bitcoin, oh, that's, you don't see any of what I'm showing. Sorry. 
This is what I was pulling up. Um, so uh, this is a spreadsheet basically assuming 10 minutes uh, every four years, 10 minutes for Bitcoin. We are right now here in this. So, I mean, you are still, you are still getting you know, 12.5 uh, per block that you can prove out. So that's, uh, what, $3,600. Uh, $3, um, in 2020, that goes down to six, so that's six, uh, $1,800. Uh, $1, that's every 10 minutes. If you have the biggest, baddest rig out there, I don't think you'll get every block, but, I mean, you could probably harvest quite a few of these. So some people would argue it. But, yeah, it is definitely the nuclear arms race. It's... Yeah, you're going to buy the bigger one, then someone else is going to buy a bigger one, and then NVIDIA is going to have one with 30 cards in it, and it's going to burn down your house because of the heat. The sun's going to look at you and say, wow, it is Phoenix. Yeah, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, honestly, that, that's really up to you. Uh, it's, I, I kind of, yeah, I, you know, you can definitely say, you know, back, you know, back in 09 when there weren't that many, it, it seemed like yeah, that's a great idea. Definitely now with what we know. But yeah, who knows? Uh, uh, Bitcoin may go back up to 20,000 a piece or it may, it may become one for one. Who knows? But it, I guess the idea for Bitcoin, it's a little bit more limiting because it is just about transactions and money. For Ethereum, it's a little bit more grandiose because it's, uh, Ethereum, the idea is building applications, it's building the next wave of applications on an open platform of blockchain. Uh, and, and it uses the currency as, as the, the way of getting that done, of incentivizing, of making sure there aren't bad actors. And so, so you know, my, I would throw in my lap with Ethereum, but that's because I like the ideas of what you can build there rather than, you know, trying to chase the money. Uh, can you give an example of what you build that would be ah. something distinct from uh, just a transaction system like an economy in a game? Uh, yes. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I said we would get to the slide. So this is uh, state of uh, state of the dapps.com. So these are there are 2,000 different apps up right now. Um, improve your health experience. Where there was one where you could race cars and mine Ethereum at the same time. Media games. Battle Royale Unity games in one ecosystem. Let's. Game several off-chain multiplayer games with the Unity web multiplock in one blockchain ecosystem currently. So I, I have no idea how this works because these people are more creative than I am. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier that I need the box to build things in. Um, this is definitely, um, I guess that's the thing is the blockchain pro uh, provides brand new ways of experiencing apps. But uh, yeah, definitely you can... Uh, so what categories? Well, let's take a look at the... Oh, yeah, my dice bot. So you can... This is one where you can basically... I, I, or I, there was another one like this where basically say, I bet this much, and then something random happens. That's the contract. And then you either get more or you get nothing. Uh, so obviously that's either... But where did the health one go? Anybody see the health? Am I missing it? Oh, yeah. So, um, bra so brave warrior reward game. Don't fall for Ponzi schemes and other pyramid. Each brave paying one point uh, one ETH to participate in one warrior losing, but receiving dividends from P three D. The winners receive thirteen spoils of war. So I guess it's you create your character. They battle each other and so forth. So. decentralized, how do they decide when the difficulty needs to go up or down? That every 2,000, it's, it's in the core code of the blockchain, of the Bitcoin blockchain. It says, every, so because it's all distributed, meaning when, uh, when the two, th and I reason I say around 2,000 because I saw one, one source that said 1,096 and another one that's a 2,013. So, but basically when it hits, when every blockchain receives that number, they all execute the same algorithm and they all come back with the next difficulty. And it is up to, again, it is up to the 
next miner that proposes the next blockchain, it will send out, uh, remember the, um, the hash is the Merkle root, the previous hash, the difficulty level, the timestamp, and the nonce. So the difficulty is part of that. It sends you the difficulty that it's shooting for. And I'm sure that there's some defensive code that if you think that the, the, the difficulty is 100 and it comes back saying, oh no, the difficulty is one, the network will probably reject the block. Yes? What is it about video cards, GPUs that are, that are attractive? Or well, think of it, uh, GPUs are attractive, and this is, I'm not an expert, um, to display anything graphical, heavy in math. And that's all that a blockchain is, is big math. Uh, the GPU is um, is performance. It's the performance enhanced. It is it is tuned for mathematical equations. It doesn't have to worry about moving a file. Yeah, yes. So it it it's the best for math. So the blockchain, when you play with it, you need to be all time in contact with the network. Uh, I mean, yes. Yeah, if you want to play on the network. Now, if you're, uh, if you are, yeah. If if you are off, the, there are some, there are some things that are being proposed that allow for off-network calculations, and that is just that's on the very cusp, and I, I don't understand that yet. But basically, yes. If you want to participate as a full mining node, you have to be in contact with the um, with the network you know, 99% of the time. I mean, you can have a little bit of downtime, but if you're down then you're in, and you miss, you know, because to, to you, downtime is money. Because if you miss the next proposed block and it gets proven, you don't have the right hash anymore. So let's say a, uh, a block gets, gets uh, proposed and one minute later you finish the block that you've been working on. Well, that block is invalid because with a minute, this other block is probably for certain good, and you've been calculating off of the hash of the block that it's pointing to. So no one else will recognize your block. So it's when you're not connected to the network and you're trying to actively mine, you will lose money. You need to be faster than the person next to you. Like if, if you get in the new block and like a tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second later you f uh, solve yours, you get that one out as fast as possible because maybe you'll just get there quicker because maybe you have a faster pipe. But I'm sure that active miners have thought of all of this and uh, are trying to maximize that as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think that's where with, uh, with, the, uh, our, uh, with the warning right there. Oh, oh, see everything that's labeled as a Ponzi? Those are the best Ponzi games. Best... 12-hour train, get 100% profit every 12 hours, <laughs> high risk, <laughs> world trade, <laughs> no, <laughs> they, they, they need the, what was, what was the uh, Apple app, the I am rich, it cost $1,000 and it just gave you a big yes. button, you need the I am rich uh, thing where you just get take uh, ETH, Ethereum from other people. So high risk, invest, <laughs> <laughs> invest, yeah. <laughs> So I, I, I hope that you guys found this valuable. I hope that, that it answered some questions. I realize it had no code in it whatsoever. Yeah, it's basically, if, if any part of this sounds interesting, please let me know. We can definitely dive into code, into theory, into any one section of it. Please not the crypto part, because that is my weakest. But if you want, I'll find someone. Yes, in the Meetup channel or on the mailing list, uh, or you just you know pull me aside later today, or yeah, definitely uh, let me know because I'm I haven't set out a schedule yet for this year. Uh, again, also uh, just as I'm just doing this every second month, that means every other month uh, the room is available. If you have something that you want to present or you want to get reviewed or just have a a session, let me know. We can set that up too. So. Um, Thank you for coming out and listen to me yeah, uh, yammer. <laughs>